C.S. Lewis made this comment in one of his essays that, that really got my attention. He's talking about canned peaches versus real peaches. And he was saying, look, canned peaches are delicious, right? I mean, they're in the sugary syrup, that kind of thing. And he kind of says, whoa, for the day in our lives where we prefer them over the real. And, and I was thinking about that, Alan, with last week's podcast and this week part yes. two, like the kid who is playing a video game about playing soccer and you get to be one of the soccer superstars, right? But it's like, when you come to prefer that to actually going outside and playing soccer, wow. the artificial has won. Welcome back to part two, everybody, here on the Wild at Heart podcast in the week of February 5th. I got that right this time. And we are riffing on a book that Alan has just released called Risk the Real. Okay, about choosing the real feels risky, but it's it's worth it every time. Yes. Okay. So we're going to unpack some more of that this week. I'm so enjoying this conversation. Uh, we yeah, we don't want to love watching people play, you know, watching people surf more than we love being in the ocean ourselves. So good. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Right. So let's take a pause and release whatever it is that's already grabbed you today. The chaos, the world, let's just take a moment, breathe, and give it all back to God. Mm. And that alone, if, if that's all you get out of this week, that alone will be a rescue. So let's, let's pause. So Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I do, I do, I just give everyone and everything to you right now. Would you help me do that? Help me to do that, God. These things that have already seized my heart, my mind, my attention, my fears, my concerns. I release the world and people and projects. Yeah, just take a moment, gang and release everything. And just notice your breathing, because when you start taking deeper breaths, you know you're coming back to yourself. Man, I love doing this. I really do. It's, I forget to do this, but releasing is so good. And so we give everyone and everything to you, God. And we ask for union and we ask for oneness. And in paying attention to our breath, we pray the breath of God that is literally breathed into humanity to make us living beings. Breath of God, fill my lungs breath of God, fill my humanity and bring me back to life. Oh man, I just love that. I love that practice. It's, it's a cornerstone to the reasonable life. It's so good just to breathe in God yes. and out mm. the world yeah. is helpful. Yeah. 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 There was a beautiful worship song, um, a while ago, I think it was by Kitty Torvald. I could be wrong, but she says, I breathe you in, God, for you are here all around me. Mm. Breathe you in, breath of life. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so this is part two. If you didn't catch last week's, you might want to go back and get that in order, but it's not critical. Um, we're riffing on a new book. We're riffing on a book that Alan just released which is really, really, really good in two ways. One, I love the layout, Alan. I love the kindness of it. Images and quotes and things that just, it's just, you know, we're all fried and we all have short attention spans. Yes. Yeah. It, a friend of mine was on their phone the other day looking for their phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... 
we yeah. we need a kind and gentle approach. Yes. I love that you've done that. But within this kind and gentle approach, it's just some really big ideas and really important ideas. So last week we were talking about the five tenets of the real. Mm-hmm. What are the tenets of the real versus the tenets of the artificial? Because yeah, we had we had had this long conversation about how the the world is in more and more sophisticated ways presenting the artificial to us to comfort, to interest, to inspire. And then it's addictive. It is. And, and part of the we didn't get we didn't even spend time on the beautiful phrase you coined. What was it? The partiality? Partificial days. Partificial. The partificial yeah. days that everyone is in because it's hard to be fully present and to be fully human. Right. And we're in this haze of what I would call the artificial anything that pulls us away from God in our day to think either in our own strength or through this bright, shiny object that the answers are there yeah, or the, or the joy is there. Yeah. And we get lost in that, John. Yep. Yeah. All of us do. Right. Yeah. And there's a sophistication to it now. Yes. As it's coming to us and being presented to us that makes it immensely alluring. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So to just be, you know, going to be super concrete this week. I'm going to ask you towards the end of the book, you've got the the real and the artificial just sort of laid out here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we talked about two last week of the real. God is the creator of reality. Right. And our reality must be rooted in him. Yes. Why? Because our reality will be rooted in something. It won't be untethered. It will attach itself to something. Our comprehension of reality, our dreams for ourselves will Mm. be tethered. Mm. And the enemy is really sophisticated and has had a lot of practice at causing us to want something that we think is the answer more than God. Mm. And so if we don't tether ourselves Mm. to how God defines reality— and him is the ultimate reality Mm. for our lives, Mm. the real, the most real, then we will tether it to something else. And and, you know, scripture, like I see it in scripture all over the place now of what idol is somebody turning to? And Mm -hmm. I see it in our world. Like we can call it the artificial, but ultimately what are we looking to for Mm. life Mm. other than God? Okay, okay. I just, it just blows my mind how all these little snippets of this is everywhere. So the Incredibles too. Okay. I, mean, I love The Incredibles. Come on. See, it's a great movie. The Incredibles 2, the whole thing is the glasses that they put on right. that changes their reality. Yes. Okay. And then they're zombies. You're right. Right? Right. Whoa, folks, Apple glasses. Like anybody paying attention to this where, you know, you can put on your glasses and you can answer your phone that's ringing with a blink of your eyes and you can give commands. And it's like, no, 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 no. You, you literally do not want to wear the artificial. And, right. And I mean, I'm looking at it going, hey, has anybody seen The Incredibles too? Is, <laughs> is anybody linking these things? Well, and it gets even more relevant to this moment. Like, so that was in The Incredibles too. Now they have wearable AI that you pin to your shirt and it listens to you all day long. It learns you and then it's right there. And when you have a question, you hold out your palm and it beams words and images onto your palm after it learned you. And so it's this weird cycle. Take it off, everybody. Stomp on it (laughs) until it is small, tiny particles. Yes. I'm serious. Like, no. Okay. Third tenet. I love this one. This is in the real. Why is the real our rescue? Union with God recreates us. Yes. Why? It recreates us because we were made in the image of God. And when we realign, not just want to do life with God, not just believe in God, acquiesce mentally, but when we, you've used this image before Mm -hmm. for union, Mm -hmm. when we are that close to God, then we are in line with reality, but more than that, with our creator. And so everything less than loses its appeal, loses its hold on us. And and without that, we've always kind of got one foot 
towards something else that might work, that might be as good or better, quicker, faster. This, this stuff literally rewires your brain one way or the other. The more that you tap into the artificial, it rewires your brain for it. And this is a fascinating thing. My son, Sam, um, who's now a therapist, was telling me about a study that was done of nuns. Oh, they were aging. No, I mean, they were older because they had practiced centering prayer for so many years, it rewired their brains. Really? Wow. Yes. Okay. To the reality of God. Mm. Okay. So th- I mean, this is like a really practical thing. Yeah. Well, who do you want rewiring you? Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, tenant number four, the fruit reveals the root. Yes. This to me is a super clarifying way to see life because if you, you know, we live in a world where we're told there are countless options. There are endless ways to see yourself, others, reality, define your version of reality. Yeah. Just be you. Just be you. Yeah. Right. Let me be me. Right. Yeah. But to go, actually, there are two trees that define reality. There's the tree of life and there's the tree of knowledge. Those were our two choices and both of them have roots. And all of reality is based on which root system you tap into. Now, there is the ultimate reality, but but the false reality is represented, I believe, by the tree of knowledge. And that was what lured Adam and Eve, right? And ever since then, we get tangled in that root system. So, we will know things by their fruit. And so you look at something, whether it is an entertainment show, um, whether it is something in politics, whether it is a business organization, uh, whether it's another person, and you go, what root system are they tapping into? Because you will know them by Mm. their fruit. Mm. And so we don't have to go, well, it's hard to tell and there's ambiguities Mm. and vagaries and could be this, could be that. We go, if there's two root systems, and the book goes more into detail on this with scripture and and ways to see it, Mm -hmm. but how do we look at the real and go, it's one of two root systems. There is no other option for something to tap into. Yeah, that's good. Dallas Willard said, reality is what you hit when you're wrong. (laughs) You can back your car up and you can can say, I wish, I wish, and I choose to, you know, ignore whether there's a cement, you know, barrier right. there, but you're going to hit it. Yes. And the fruit will tell you. Absolutely. It, it's this flourishing human existence. Is this numbing and then deteriorating human existence? Yeah, yes. that's good. Okay. I want to do one more on the real because I want to get to the artificial as well. Because this feels, I think as we daylight the artificial, people will go, oh, now yeah. I know what yeah. Alan's talking about. Tenant five is pretty big. No, actually, I'm going to, as a teaser, I'm going to hold that. We're going to come back to 10 okay. and 5. Okay. okay. So we're going to go to the lies of the artificial. Um, lie number one, the artificial is real. Exactly. This taps into what you said at the beginning of the podcast, which I didn't know you are going to use. This, I hadn't heard that C.S. Lewis quote. And you talked about soccer as well. But the artificial, one of the more nefarious things it tries to do is position itself as somehow more real than the real. And so through the artificial, it tries to tell us, no, no, no. If you're really good at a video game, you know, of soccer, then you're a pro at that. Like that's, that's the real deal. And you go, actually, you're just moving your thumbs really fast and your brain is being wired into this digital false reality, right? Yes. And I'm not knocking gaming. I'm just saying, but when we start to want the artificial or the things in our lives that we construct to make our life easy or work, and we go, that's just who I am. That's just the way I am. What we're really saying is, We have found an artificial way to prop our lives up and try to make it work without Mm -hmm. the most real being, Mm. God. Yeah, okay. Okay. Lie number two, the machine is neutral. This will really get me going, Alan. (laughs) Why does it get you going? Um, Because as 
particularly generative AI was rolling out. Everybody was saying, chill out, man. This is right. not a big deal. And now you get the designers of it going, uh-oh, uh, we think it's a big deal and we're not sure where it's headed. And it, it, whatever it was, you know, the advancement in uh, technological warfare and these things, they're, they're not neutral. No. But tell me why, tell me why. Well, it's not neutral, number one, because it, to me, it reminds me a lot in the creation of it. When you listen to some of the, the quotes and comments by the head of organizations like Google or, or the virtual reality that's being done now, you know, by the creator of Facebook, and you, you start looking at this and hear what the people involved are saying, it's relatively godless conversation. Like there is not an awe of God. It is an awe of man. And it reflects to me mm. at its roots, the Tower mm. of Babel. And I'm not mm. saying there's not good components to it, but I mean, even the tree of knowledge was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yes. So it's no excuse for something. And I go into this in the book to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But look at the, look at the good. Mm. Okay. Look at the good, but look at the comprehensive nature as a whole with the roots and so many of the creators are saying things like, um, AI is not God yet, but we're getting closer. Yeah. Th these are yeah. the people that are designing it yeah. and who now this thing is transcending yes. anything they thought. Yeah. And again, this isn't a podcast or a book about AI. No. It's just such a startling example of a whole world. Right where the artificial wants to become more attractive to you. Right. More alluring. Right. In Isaiah, there's the, the scripture and the story that he tells about the woodsman, right? And he cuts down a tree and half of it he uses for fire to warm himself. And half of it, he carves into an idol and he bows down and he says, save me. And so this has been going on since the beginning mm. of time. Mm. But whatever we're mm. looking at as the mm. artificial that we say, help me, save me, make me, we are tapping into this thing other than God, the artificial. And and when Isaiah is, is trying to daylight that and go, hey, everybody, he literally uses the phrase, no one stops to think. Mm. He's like, hey. Can, can we all stop for a second and just take a look at what's going on here? Right. These guys are creating idols. In, in the, because we're not literally bowing down before a stone image of something these days, we don't think that idolatry is still rampant in the human soul and, and in the world. But when you said, you, just, you saw me drop my head when you, when you said, save me. I'm like, holy cow, what am I asking? What am I asking right. to save me? Right, right. Like, it, it, and when we, that's why it's important to broaden our definition of the artificial, right? Because when we see it through those eyes, then it takes the conversation. It doesn't exclude or give AI a free pass, but we're not, we're not stuck in the world of AI here. It goes back to almost every aspect of our life. Okay, so when you say the machine is neutral, I just wanna, I just wanna tell everybody, look, um, you have to ask what is going to inhabit this? Right. Right? Right. What is going to inhabit what we've created? Yeah. You look like you're, you're searching for- Keep going, I'm just, I'm just getting <laughs> oh, okay. the queuing up All a right. quote. All right. This next one, Alan, feels like it comes a little bit out of your personal experience. The lie is, if you're concerned, you're the problem. Right. There's a lot of passion I have on this one, but I think we've all experienced it so, in some come way. Come on, tell us why. <laughs> well, so in any organization or team, if you work for any company or whatever, there's there are now conversations about how AI can help you do your job better, faster. It's like the $6 million man, you know, we've made him faster, better, stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have always in the last year or two in those conversations felt this push, something in me. And so the, even the other day, uh, a coworker was talking to me about, you know, you don't have to write the copy for the podcast. You can just ask AI to write it for you. And 
we have weekly podcasts and I write the copy and the title it and everything. And, and I could feel in me like, I don't want like, no. And, and so it's not just AI, but it's anywhere technology, mm-hmm. John tries to get in. And if I bring it up, people will say, oh, come on, quit talking about like new, newer vehicles. When you go to close the hatchback, they have the button. And if you don't push the button, if you just try to close it, like it'll fight you. <laughs> and it makes me so mad. And, and even my wife is like, just push the button. It's so yeah. simple. I'm like, I don't want to push the button. Yes. I, and I feel like that way is my response to a lot of technology or artificial in my life. I don't want the things that the world is offering for shortcuts and easy. Exactly. I like air conditioning. I like instant coffee, you know, certain things that can go quick. But in general, I want to feel life and I want to be a part of what God has created me to be. And so when I raise the issues, I just notice there's an immediate Rear. pushback. Oh, right? there is totally. Okay. So here's the extreme. Heard an interview the other day with Elon Musk, and he was saying, Oh, the day is coming where nobody will have to work anymore. And, and our, our challenge as a human race will be what to do with our free time, all these wonderful things that you can now take up painting or the cello or all that sort of thing, because no one will have to work. And I'm like, Whoa, anybody listening to this? Right. If you have a worldview that is grounded in a good and loving creator and you in his image, you understand that work yes. is essential to human happiness. Right. I want to fix my car. I want to till the earth. Right. I want to, right? Exactly. And what you're saying is you're not even letting me close the hatch on my own car. Right. <laughs> and this whole thing of, but it's more efficient. Like God is not a God of efficiency, right? So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so lie four, progress is always good, which is tied to that. And we get to lie number five. The artificial is the future. Get used to it. Yes. This That's such a toxic thought that I think is out there now where if we have conversations with friends or in work, it's kind of like we don't, we shouldn't even be talking about this because it's just reality. And even that phrase, it's just reality. And you go, no, no, no. Reality is something over here. The artificial isn't just reality, but the artificial again is trying to insert itself yeah. and embed mm-hmm. itself in every part of our lives. Make itself irreplaceable. Yes, absolutely. So the more it knows us, the more we look to, and I'm talking now about chat, GPT, AI, Google searches, whatever, the more that it gets to know us, the more that we like it because we like ourselves pretty, you know, we want what we want. And so there is this sense of, like there was a school um, example I give in the book where teachers are being told they need to help younger students work with AI. And they present two options. One option is not a good option, they say. It's as a teacher, you don't want the mm-hmm. students to cheat using AI. In other words, to write their papers. Yeah. Another option is you learn to use AI in a way that's helpful. And I'm reading this and I'm like, but there's no third option, which is exactly we can do life without this thing. It, both options, the thing is it's already embedded. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Catch up. Get yeah. used to it. Yeah. So the book moves against that. Okay. That same argumentation was used 10 years ago for iPads in elementary schools. Mm. Like every child needs an iPad because this is just the future, folks. Get used to it. They're going to do creative work on it. And that, you know, it's going to release human potential. You go, whoa, hang on. There is a place for these things. Right. They can be helpful. Right. But we don't want them to substitute for human Creativity, learning, trial, difficulty, character shaping, right? Oh. Right. And, and just think of anything, John. So let's take it off AI and technology. What is it in your life that you feel like my life could not work without it that isn't of God? And, and, and that's really exposing. You know, it may be I can't get through the evening after a hard day without a couple of drinks. Yeah. It could be... I need to numb myself with 
something on Netflix that I just watch yes. mindlessly. Yes. So whatever it is, the artificial will tell you, right, you cannot get by without me. Oh gosh, numbing. You just reminded me of something. So years and years ago, Blaine was like eight or nine years old and he actually had heart surgery. He had he had a couple of holes in his heart mm. that needed to be closed. It was a, yeah, it was a really, whew, um, pins and needles moment yes. in our lives. Worked out great. He's doing great. You know, he's 6'2 and athletic. Right. And yeah. Um, but we go into the children's hospital and he gets in his gown and, you know, nervous mom and dad and nervous eight-year-old boy, nervous boy. And the nurse looks to us and says, he can have Valium or video games. They actually do the same thing to the brain. What would you prefer? Oh, Wow. So there it is, the yeah, numbing, right. the sedation. And the false narrative of two choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so the wow. artificial is the future. Get used to it is the fifth lie of the artificial. I'm going to come back to the fifth tenet of the real, because this is kind of the invitation of your book. Yeah. You say, give everything for the most real. Right. What's that? So... I think we have been conditioned in life. This is what, as I was writing the book and wrestling myself with it, that I discovered is we are conditioned to hold back a little bit, to, to have some means of backup plan, mm -hmm. escape, option B, C, D, yep. right? And so when we find the most real, the only true option that I think we have is Give it all to that. Don't have a backup plan. Mm. Another, you know, in, in other words, like in scripture, look at all the stories we love. And it's amazing, John, like there is no backup plan. When Moses is facing the Red Sea, there is no backup plan yeah. that he has. Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego yeah. in the fiery furnace. Yeah. Esther, like there are no backup plans because- Jesus. Ah. The cross. Jesus at the cross. Yeah. Because they have discovered the most real and they will give everything for that. And I believe that's partially why for most believers, their faith feels so wobbly and, and so uneven because we don't want to give mm. it all mm. for the most real. Mm. We want to give some, mm. but also have the backup plan. That's ancient. That's ancient. So that, I mean, you're saying the most real is God. Right. And, and, and the reality he has created. Right. 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 And what we would call impossible, this was an eye opener for me in the book. What I used to call impossible, meaning, well, yeah, I'd love to give God full control over my finances, but there's no way I can do this or do that and mm -hmm. still pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Or take your pick of anything in life, right? Mm. And we go, but yeah, but that that's kind of impossible. And then to go, but if God created reality and we see throughout scripture, reality bends to God's will, mm. then now the scriptures make sense to me that mm. nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. With God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way to say, when you live focused on the most real, with when you're focused on the artificial, Yep, a lot's impossible. Nothing's going to give the full promise that it offers. Mm. It's artificial. Mm. It has limits. Mm. It will be exposed. When you live for the most drill, anything is possible because what can God not do? Yeah. We just are afraid, yeah. I think, to fully step into that story. Alan, that has been in the human heart since we chose the wrong tree, right? Since humanity fell. Yeah. But we're living in a moment where technology, science, global development, wealth has allowed us to 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 think that it's possible. No, no, we really we can make life work without God. Right. Right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about people with a backup plan. For most people, God is the backup plan. He's plan B. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. I have a plan A. 
Yes. And, and because there's so many options presented by a highly mechanized age, right? Totally. That, man, it's going to be fascinating because if that breaks, if that ever breaks. <laughs> and it will. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The, um, you want to be the person. This is back to house built on the sand, house built on the rock, right? Right. Mm. And, and the, yeah. you know, the title of the book, Risk the Real, like, all of that leads into, okay, mm-hmm. if there is this clash, artificial, the real, yeah. well, then now we're walking through it and how do we risk well? And I think a lot of us are conditioned to either be in the mindset of, I'm a, I'm a huge risk taker. I'll do anything. I'll be the bull in the china shop. I'll make it happen. And, and we pat ourselves on the back as the make it happen person who just risks and somehow does pretty well or we're risk averse and we try to get through life with very little risk and think we can. And what most amazed me going through this journey of writing this book and and researching it and living it is God actually likes risk. God created risk. One of the very first things he allows Adam and Eve to do is risk. He lets them risk a decision, right? He, he could have navigated it where he just kept them away from any choice or risk, and he didn't. Mm-hmm. And then we look at God, mm-hmm. and God is quite comfortable with risk. But but you're not saying it's risk for risk's sake, right? No. Like people who love cliff jumping or big wave riding, and that that's the real life, right? That You're not saying that. Not at all. You're saying in this hour to choose God as the... One who defines reality. Yes. What is human? What is the good life? Right. Is really risky. Right. And I think, as we've said in the podcast in the last few weeks even, it is getting riskier all the time as we approach the end of the age, however we define that, as we get closer and closer to Mm -hmm. the end of this part of the story, Mm -hmm. the heat is you know, mm-hmm. it's it's increasing. And so how do we risk with God for what matters most? I mean, we're born for such a time as this. Yeah. But if we don't enter into it and risk mm. with God, he will find somebody else like the Esther story. If you don't speak, yeah. you know, it still yeah. will happen. Mm. But yep. John, that's, I think, huge. And the book goes into why, but we have lost the ability as we have lost track of what's real, I think we've lost the ability of how to risk in a way that God created us to for a story that's the story. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you for writing Risk the Real, available on Amazon. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah, beautiful book, beautiful truths. Hope you've enjoyed it, everybody. It's really, really important. 